So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this uh, Reclaim uh, number 10 in our webinar series. Um, so Reclaim is a urban network plus, so it's funded by EPSRC, which is one of the UK research councils and also has joint funding from um, the National Environment Research Council and Arts and Humanities Research Council. So the idea is this is an interdisciplinary network focusing on urban, pressure, urban pressures, urban problems, and the way that green infrastructure, green, blue, gray infrastructure can help alleviate those and contribute to the leveling up agenda. So there are five uh, kind of core management members in the network. So the network is led by uh, University of Surrey, so Professor, Professor Prashant Kumar in Surrey. So he has an air quality background. Um, I co-lead, so I'm Professor Lawrence Jones from UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology. And I bring expertise on ecosystem services and the benefits of green and blue infrastructure. So we also have uh, Dr. Neria Calvillo at University of Warwick and Neria uh, brings in arts and humanities and also an architecture background. So she brings that expertise to the consortium. Dr. Sheila Malam at University of Bangor is a marine ocean scientist. So she brings uh, that kind of marine blue uh, expertise into the consortium. And then we have Dr. Thomas Gelson at the University of Bath. Uh, Thomas is a hydrologist. So between us, we, we cover a wide set of the kind of interdisciplinary expertise that's useful for this kind of network. So we have two network managers, and uh, so that's Mark and Charlotte who are helping coordinate things today. And we have over 450 members, a mix of UK and overseas. So just a, a very little bit about the network what we do. So we do a range of activities, including sort of funding small grants, funding uh, knowledge exchange visits, workshops, etc. And this is a key component of what we do is running this webinar series. So we run these monthly. There's, it's usually the first uh, Wednesday of every month, and we have two speakers, and we try and mix it so that we have a, a mix of academic and non-academic speakers. So welcome to this, the 10th webinar series uh, of the series. If you want to contribute to future webinars, then please get in touch. It'd be great to have um, people showcasing different expertise right across the right across the UK. So our first uh, speaker today is uh, Dr. Dan Evans. So I will uh, briefly introduce Dan, but just so that you know, our second speaker is Ross Sterling. So Ross is director of the UK Crick National Green Infrastructure Facility. The talks are 20 minutes each, and then we'll have time for questions after that. So I will just briefly bring up Dan's bio. So Dan's talking on uh, the topic of building tomorrow's soils in urban spaces. He works at Cranfield University, where he holds an anniversary research fellowship. He leads both fundamental and applied research, principally focusing on soil formation and the parent materials from which soil is formed. Part of his fellowship focuses on how we can optimize soil formation in towns and cities to enhance urban health, sustainability, and resilience. In the context of green infrastructure and urban agriculture, his talk highlights findings of recent work on the quality of manufactured soils and changes in their quality over time, and the key knowledge gaps that require further transdisciplinary research. So I will hand over to Dan now. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Lawrence. And I'm just about to share my, my screen. Um, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, and I'm delighted to, to be here at this Reclaim webinar this afternoon. Um, and to uh, all of you uh, listening and, and partaking in this webinar from wherever you are uh, across the globe, uh, I hope you're having a, a great Wednesday. 
I don't know if you can see the screen or not. Uh, I think I'm getting some thumbs up, so that's wonderful. Yeah, and let me just... Brilliant, thank you. Um, let's just uh, introduce myself um, a little bit more uh, fully then, um, and uh, just building on what Lawrence um, uh, said there. Um, so I, I hold a research fellowship within the School of Water, Energy and Environment, and uh, this is based at Cranford University, where uh, we have um, uh, separate themes for perhaps the, the, the main grand challenges that we, uh, that we face um, around the globe. And uh, with my uh, soils expertise, um, I find that there are so many of these challenges which, um, where soils have a part to play. And uh, often or not in meetings, um, workshops, seminars, conferences, we often get to perhaps bog down into uh, what soils provide, what they can deliver. Um, in fact, um, even this, this morning, there was a, uh, a Innovate UK seminar on, on the importance of, of soil health. Um, but I'm um, uh, in, a, in a way slightly uh, in, more interested in how we form soils in the first place, because without soil formation, um, one doesn't obviously have the soil um, to, uh, to, to measure the health of, and, and obviously those, those services, those functions which soils provide are, um, are fundamentally dependent on the very fact that soils um, uh, need to form and they, and they need to form in, in particular ways. So, so the, the large part of my research to date and expertise is in soil formation, the process thereof. Um, but also the parent materials, the, the resources from which soils may form. And this is often, um, I, I kind of like to divide these up into to two main categories. The first of which are what I would call natural parent materials or residual parent materials. So uh, materials like bedrock that uh, steadily over time create soils via weathering processes largely. Um, and I, my work today has been focused on measuring rates of soil formation from bedrock, uh, the functions that these um, parent materials provide to soil properties, um, and in many ways how the, bed, the bedrock, how those parent materials support those ecosystem surfaces. So carbon storage and sequestration is, is one aspect of that. Um, but also the resilience of these parent materials to land use and climate pressures. So um, rather than just focus on what the challenges are to soils, I'm particularly interested in, in thinking about how those challenges affect the very materials which form soils in the first place. And I think that in many ways is, is where perhaps we need to go, not just within soil science, but uh, across, um, across environment and, and, and agri-food. But then we come, and this is very, uh, very much the focus of my talk today, to manufactured parent materials or engineered parent materials. And here I refer to the formation of substrates and growing media and how these can be used in particular situations where we need soils at large volume over a short space of time. And often or not, that is in the case of urban agriculture and urban green infrastructure. So my talk today uh, comes off the back of uh, some recent funding from NERC, um, a cross-disciplinary research program for discovery science and a project that I lead here at Cranfield, which is based on examining the resilience of manufactured soil in the context of urban green infrastructure. And you're, uh, at the end of my presentation, I'll, I'll send you or, uh, a link uh, to that if you're interested in finding out more about that particular project. But what, what I want to do today in the time that I've been allotted is just share some um, uh, insights into this project that we've uh, amassed to date. So we know that urban green infrastructure um, can, comprises of, of you know, many different uh, types uh, and forms, uh, all the way from parks and grasslands to those community gardens and allotments, cemeteries, private gardens, and so on. Um, and that each of these delivers a range of ecosystem goods and services. And uh, some research which I uh, uh, conducted just uh, previous to, to this project um, 
which was part of a, a global food security program project called Urban Revolution. Um, this uh, piece of research was a systematic review of all the ecosystem services delivered from edible um, and non-edible non uh, urban infrastructure. So in other, other words, urban agriculture and those uh, non-edible types uh, that I was just mentioning. Um, the, the main finding from this is that actually all of these um, have the potential to provide um, many of the ecosystem services down on that table on, on the right hand side there. And there was no real distinction between the services provided by edible um, urban agriculture um, than those by um, uh, non-edible or, or urban green infrastructure. But the main point behind this is that the long-term capacity of these infrastructures to deliver those services really depends on the resources which are used. Um, and one of the most important, I'd argue, and obviously I'm slightly biased here, but I'd say that a really important resource that we have here uh, in these schemes is soil. And soil is a very much valued material, not just because of its uh, contributions to natural capital. So those sustainable development goals, life on land, clean water and sanitation, but they very other the aspects of what we might call connected resilience. And this is a, uh, a five part framework that um, colleagues of mine here at Cranfield within the Resilience Grand Challenge have conceived. So the idea that we have human capital built capital, social capital and financial capital, all of which may depend on, to some extent, soil um, for, their, for their functioning. If we think about how soils are formed and how quickly they're formed, I think it's common knowledge that soils form over a, a very long time. It's a very slow process and naturally speaking, those natural parent materials I was referring to, the bedrock, for instance, you get about 0.03 to 0.2 millimeters a year from those types of lithologies. And uh, that means that with uh, an average human hair's width of soil produced annually, that doesn't amass the volume of soil which you need for some of these urban green infrastructure schemes. So for these particular schemes where we need lots of soil and reasonably quickly and perhaps homogenous um, to fit the bespoke needs of the client, we need a very different approach to the generation of soils. So the question is, well, you know, where and how do we generate these particular soils? Well, one opportunity is what we might call as dug. Um, and of course, um, I'm speaking to a multidisciplinary audience here, so I know that some of the language um, uh, may be different, some of the definitions and things, but uh, here I'm referring to uh, soils which, uh, in a sense, are removed from uh, natural terrain. And the benefits um, of these is that they come from this single source, they're unscreened most of the time, they're, the soils are already formed, and so those vital properties, so microbiology, uh, structure and so on, are to some extent already established. And that means that some emerging properties like resilience may already be present in these systems. And you can see on the right hand side, that photograph literally of a, a strip of soil being removed for um, uh, uh, use in an as dug natural topsoil. The problem is that these natural topsoils are relatively non-renewable and stripping the uppermost 30 centimetres of soil from these systems probably equates to around 10,000 years worth of soil formation. So what may be sustainable and resilient for our urban, agricult um, urban agriculture or um, non-edible green infrastructure scheme may not be resilient for these uh, natural systems. So we come on to the idea of a manufactured soil, and here I refer to the organic and inorganic blend of materials which are sourced and combined off-site, away from the, the, the scheme um, in question, and then subsequently transported for placement at these, um, at these sites. And so uh, we know in the literature that these have often been called various uh, things, engineered soils, artificial soils, 
uh, fabricated soils, I mean, the list is, is rather lengthy. But all of these, no matter what you call them, um, have the, the, the role in delivering some core functions. And many of these will mirror those which we see in our agricultural farmland, cycling nutrients, urban biodiversity, plant growth, and, and importantly, particularly now as we combat climate change, sequestering carbon into those systems. The problem is, is that the long-term capability of these manufactured soils to respond and recover to the threats that, threat that we face is, is unknown and unquantified. And I think there are two specific issues here. One which relates to the generation of these soils, so the off-site um, issue, and one relating to how these soils are monitored going forward after their placement, so an, an on-site issue. I want to, what I want to do is demonstrate this in a very quick case study. So this is based on some research we did last year in London, and it was from a master's thesis project, which I led here at Cranfield with a couple of industry partners. And so the context behind this uh, particular site is that the soils were manufactured um, to a British standard spec. Uh, for many of you, this is a uh, very uh, well-versed spec, 3882, uh, 2015 version. Uh, all properties uh, were compliant at the point of their placement, and uh, they were transported, installed into these raised beds that you see on the bottom right-hand side of the screen um, in around September 21, so just, just under a year um, before the project started. And one year after their installation, uh, the client phoned up the manufacturer and said, well, we have around 200,000 pounds worth of costs related to tree death. Um, so the question is, well, what went wrong for these systems? Why did we uh, experience such a cost? And this gets back to my two reasons for uh, needing to improve our um, knowledge and understanding about the resilience of manufactured soils. The first one is, is, is based off size, bound to the production. As you see on the right hand side, this is a, a table indicating the variables which are listed in the BS, the British Standard 3882. This is the spec for topsoil. And you can see that for many of the variables, there is a very wide range. And for sand content, for example, um, the range is anywhere between 20 and 90 percent. And this actually covers nine of the 12 soil types in our soil texture triangle. The second point here is that at no point down that list do you get any reference to soil biology. Uh, and this is quite stark because from a soil science background, we think of soils as this living, breathing system in, in many ways. The fact that we don't have a variable related to soil biology in the spec means that we can't generate soils with that in mind. And you'll see that down the list here, we're in, you know, we're, we're looking at properties, soil properties, very much um, how the soils are characterized upon placement. But principles of resilience, so how well they, they, they cope. Um, when faced with uh, different environmental and anthropological pressures, um, anthropogenic pres pressures um, are not there in that list. So I think there is an area of discussion regarding how we build resilience into the very generation of the soils in the first place. But it's also a very important issue around monitoring as well. Once these soils are installed, soils are very rarely monitored, usually after about six months post-placement, they're less regarded as the client's issue and, and more regarded as the general urban green infrastructure of the area. And this means that there's no real one point of contact at the moment um, to uh, have the obligation of monitoring these manufactured soils. And so the issue there is that we don't necessarily have the data um, over a sufficiently long time period to assess how these soils change and respond. Um, particularly to the climate. And of course, in London last summer, we experienced, uh, as most of Europe did, um, a terrific drought. Interestingly enough, actually, our results showed that in one year alone, these soils um, had, saw a reduction of 10% in organic carbon. And um, we put that down to the fact that there's no 
uh, additional amendments being placed onto these soils uh, in contrast to what might happen in an agricultural farm. So we have very little knowledge about how these, these soils are resilient to, to the challenges that may confront us in the future. So the, the main issue here is, is one based on generation, one based on monitoring. And I think um, there is sufficient um, gaps here to warrant future research, but also perhaps future changes to the ways in which we build British standards and particularly here for the 3882, which hasn't been, as I say, amended since 2015. There are interesting discussions to have between research and industry and policy to some extent around how we get that uh, principle of resilience into these, uh, into these schemes. If you want more information, there is a very, um, I'm slightly biased here, I'm self-citating, so I'm, I'm holding my hands up, but there is a, an article which I and some of the industry clients I've worked with um, penned for the Pro Landscape, and you can see that in um, February's issue, um, and that will give some more context behind the project. And I'd be very happy to have further discussion and collaboration with you around that, so you can see my details there, and that tiny URL link refers to um, the, uh, uh, my personal profile, which will take you to this project, enhancing the resilience of manufactured soils for urban green infrastructure. So with that, thank you very much for your attention and I'd be delighted to take uh, any questions that you may have. Thank you very much, Dan. So uh, thank you for keeping the time and having a very nice, succinct talk. And as I mentioned, we're gonna have a joint question and answer session at the end of the two talks. So I will thank the stopping sharing so I will now introduce uh, Ross Sterling. So Ross uh, works at the UK Trip National Green Infrastructure Facility. He's a director um, based on Newcastle and he's also a lecturer in geotechnical infrastructure at Newcastle University. His interests centre on engineered approaches to achieve more resilient and sustainable urban green spaces. He has expertise in climate plant soil interactions and the work at the green infrastructure facility explores vegetative techniques for maximising surface water bioretention. And his work also addresses challenges in achieving net zero through carbon capture and through ground source heat. So with that, I will move over to the boss. Thanks very much, Lawrence. Uh, hopefully everyone can see my, my title slide there. Um, in great contrast to Dan, um, I'm going to rattle through um, and hopefully keep the time. Um, I'm glad uh, that Dan gives me a, a few more minutes. Um, so yes, I'm Ross Sterling from the National, or should I say UCRIC National Green Infrastructure Facility. Um, so I'm one of the directors. There's also um, Claire Walsh, Dr. Claire Walsh, um, who covers the more hydrology side of things. Um, so should uh, acknowledge that and many contributions from uh, many researchers, um, many too many to list at, at the moment. Um, so without further ado, um, I went to slide, there we go. Um, so the outline for this talk is going to be around a, a very brief whistle stop tour um, through Ucric, Newcastle Helix, which is the site that we're based on uh, in Newcastle on Tyne, and the um, NGIF. I'm going to use NGIF as shorthand for National Green Infrastructure Facility from now on because it's a bit of a mouthful and uh, <laughs> it'll take up a bit of my time. Um, so a bit of introduction to, to what the features are and what the capability is research-wise, and then briefly touch on a couple of projects, um, one that's just completed uh, and one that's partway through. Um, then I'll move on to um, talking about the monitoring and data side of things. Um, obviously, Dan's just mentioned um, continual monitoring of green spaces is a, a gap at the moment. Um, so it's something we're very much keen on, on exploring um, and seeing what the capabilities are there in comparison, in conjunction with our, our computing um, colleagues as well. So we're looking at a lot of smart infrastructure um, interventions as well in green infrastructure and the, the cross-disciplinarity of that. Um, there's also the, the availability of that data um, and the engagement side to what we do as a, as a facility. Um, this is not just an invitation to come visit us, um, but it's also an explanation of, of what we can do to help uh, business and, and academia. Um, and finally, sort of where to, where to learn more and how to uh, contact us. So 
um, UCRIC. Um, so I believe Lawrence has just explained the, the long-winded acronym. Uh, I think in this webinar series, you've already had speakers from UCRIC, uh, particularly Professor uh, Chris Rogers from Birmingham University as uh, one of the founding um, members. Um, so I won't go too much into the, the broader uh, mission statements um, of UCRIC, um, but just to say it's a uh, £138 million um, UK government investment, um, bringing together research capability in the form of um, well, facilities, physical facilities at different institutions around the UK, um, but also observatories, so um, capabilities to observe the, the functioning as a, a living lab of various uh, cities around the UK. Um, being a, a water uh, facility in particular, um, work particularly closely with uh, with other water facilities in the UCRIC um, network, um, namely Sheffield on water distribution, Cranfield on water and, and wastewater treatment, um, and since Newcastle, we cover the, the green infrastructure side of things. So close to home, just talking about Newcastle uh, alone, that was uh, just shy of a £10 million uh, Bayes investment as announced in the government's uh, 2015 autumn statement. Um, although we got the keys and we, we opened up and started actively conducting our research uh, in September 2017, uh, we were officially opened in January 2020. Um, which wasn't wasn't the best timing in hindsight of a, of a physical facility, um, but uh, we made a splash on the day um, and quickly uh, worked out a new way of working. So this is what we look like. This is the the uncanny valley of uh, of an artist's of a, an architect's um, rendering of what the site looks like. So um, this is our sort of triangle here in the centre um, of the Newcastle Helix site. So this is a 24-acre uh, former oak, open cast mine, now city centre, um, and subsequently the Newcastle Brewery site. So this is where you, Newcastle Brown Ale um, would have come from, um, and, and now um, it's a, a series of different um, different land use types, um, covering university. Um, so we've got three buildings on site. Um, and commercial use, so office space, spin out companies, that sort of thing, and residential space. Um, you'll notice a lot of green roofs going on. Um, the buildings that are complete at this stage, um, those green roofs have actually happened. Uh, sometimes they get uh, value engineered out, which is a great shame, um, but so far so good. Um, it, is, it is quite a green oasis in an otherwise uh, concrete ridden built environment. Um, orientating more, uh, understandably, so we're now sort of north-south. Um, in that former slide, we've got the, the tie in just off the slide um, to the top there. Um, but in this situation, this is showing some of the modelling that was done as part of the, um, the master planning for the site. Um, so this is using CityCat, which is a, a catchment-based um, sort of CDF-based model, um, I believe, uh, so, um, looking at, at surface water flows um, in response to a, a digital terrain model. And here we're simulating a 100 year event uh, for a 15 minute duration uh, plus 30% climate change, which at the time was the standard. I believe that's, that's increased now. Um, and what we can see is the, the red line here shows the boundary of, of the helix site. And the arrows are showing inflows where water's coming from the, the upper catchment. So we're, we're uphill towards the sort of northwest of this, uh, this um, map here. And what we see is a, a gathering of surface water, particularly around the corner of this building. Um, this is the Urban Sciences Building, this triangular one, and that's where NGIF is based. So that's where we have our offices and our lab. Um, but most of our, our work is conducted out on the streets, just uh, just to the west. So you can see we're, we've located ourselves in a, in a problem hotspot. Um, we're one of the one of the main uh, through flows from the upper catchment towards the city centre. City centre being sort of southeast of this um, this plot here. So. We're there as a, as a functioning green infrastructure um, feature, um, but we also take advantage of that um, to make use of it for, for monitoring and experimental purposes. And I'm guessing the next slide is obviously quite image heavy because it's uh, struggling to, to change over. Um, but what it will show you is how we've used um, our position in the city um, to try and intercept those flows using quite a, an array of different green infrastructure features, um, both retention and detention ponds. So there's ultimately going to be some standing water on site, um, but also tiered and sort of terraced um, suds features, so sustainable drainage systems, um, which allow for a, a treatment train um, approach. It's still struggling to move on to the next slide, which is 
particularly unfortunate. Um, anticipation is nine tenths of the pleasure. So they tell me. Do you want me to try and share my slides, maybe? Um, yes, please. It's now saying not responding. Um, to apologize. Don't know why. Excellent, thank you. So yes, that's that's the slide um, I was hoping to get to. Um, so the, the photo in the centre um, showing that that terraced approach, um, allowing water to cascade from one feature to the next. Uh, we've got... um, Sean, can you make that for me? Yeah, I'm, uh... I'm trying, sorry, one second. <laughs> we can see it fairly clearly now, it's not good just going on. Yeah. Um, yes, other features around, so there's a green wall, um, it's arguably not part of the sort of hydrological um, approaches we use, um, but you can see there the distribution of green air, green spaces across the side. The residential area, thanks Charlotte, the residential area in the top left is yet to be built, um, and in the style of a, of a COVID briefing, I'm going to say next slide please. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so this is what, what the last, the latest Google flyover shows, although this is Clearly, probably about three or four years out of date, several of these buildings to the bottom are already built. Um, but that residential area is that whopping great big bare patch, um, which is, is yet to be built. Um, but what you can see is our nice green swale um, to, the, to the eastern edge of that. And what that's difficult to show in, in 2D uh, is that that's a gradient down there. And you can make out the berms um, that we've got on there. And that, what that does is help direct some of the flow from the upper catchment that comes onto the site towards the top of that swale, making use of the longest flow path, allowing for infiltration and, and passive treatment uh, as water's passed through that. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So top down, bit of a better photo. So this is our building, the Green Infrastructure Facility uh, based in the Urban Sciences Building. Um, next slide, please. Um, what's probably easier is to show it as a, as a diagram. What I'll do is I'll, I'll go feature by feature. Next slide, please. Um, so we've got our ensembles. So these are in-ground, plots um they are um well three meters by five meters on average and 1.2 meters deep and they're filled with different soil types um, so we're allowed to do we're able to play around there with different planting schemes looking at different um different performance factors um but also the behavior of different soil types um, next slide please they are lined so you can see there an empty one with a drain and what that allows us to do is to capture any through flow um, so they are contained in so much as whatever's entered those systems we're able to measure and monitor. So we can take samples, we can do chemical analysis if we wished. Uh, typically we work on the basis of quantity um, analysis. Um, I won't go through every planting style, but just to highlight the, the edible side of things. So we've got a, a Alethea Goddard who's working on um, edible green infrastructure, particularly herbs and the resilience of those. Um, last year was a was a gift to a PhD project, um, having a, a a drought looking at, at resilience of uh, particular planting styles um, and the bottom few plots on carbon capture so mixing sand with dolerite or um, crushed concrete so demolition waste so that's a sort of enhanced weathering approach of fixing calcium carbonate in soils uh, next slide please uh, on the other side of the street so immediately next to the building we have our lysimeters um, so there are 10 in total different shapes and sizes um, allowing pretty much each one is a different experiment in itself if you projects use, uh, use multiple lysimeters, but just as a, a flavor of what, what kind of experiments we undertake there um, look like. We look at heat exchange, um, a bit more on that in a moment. Um, climate impacts are rather weather-driven deterioration of transport corridors, looking at slopes and green infrastructure on slopes. Um, biochar soil amendment um, for carbon capture, um, evapotranspiration style of things, particularly looking at the, bio, at the, uh, the vegetation side of things. Orifice control, so using the full capacity, the storage capacity of, of our suds uh, to maximize the attenuation behavior. Um, and vegetated climate adaptation barriers. So they're, they're a bit of a, an odd one in that you're letting just the right amount of water in, but not too much. Uh, and that's a project that's ongoing and I'll come to in a moment. And, and finally, um, a controversial one on the, the permeable paving side of things. It comes under the heading of suds, but uh, perhaps not the greenest of, of infrastructure. Uh, next slide, please. So inside, um, we have a, a bijou uh, laboratory um, in which we do a lot of the soil physics testing side of things. Um, 
one particular project is uh, another PhD. Um, this is Narin Thaman, um, working with the British Geological Survey, developing a, a electrical resistivity tomography tool. So this is a way of passing current through a known volume of soil and being able to visualize volumetrically the, the changes in water content. And he's looking at the, the influence of vegetation on that um, with a direct relevance to, to suds and green infrastructure. So he's scanning roots, understanding the presence of roots and their impact on root water uptake, uh, how that affects um, the hydrological performance of soils. Next slide, please. Um, the other one is the green roof. So um, nice and uh, south facing, we have this green roof on, on the Urban Sciences Building. Uh, if only it looked as green in the top uh, <laughs> um, movie as it always, uh, as it, well, sadly it doesn't. Typically last summer, um, particularly um, poorly, poorly affected, largely given the, um, the very shallow rooting depth um, that we have there. And, um, thin layer of soil, uh, but that's similarly monitored. Um, we have uh, moisture content sensors and, and runoff uh, measurements from the green roof. Next slide, please. Um, and last but by no means least uh, is our swale. Um, so it's certainly the largest, most eye grabbing um, feature uh, at the facility. Um, so that's a 130 meter long um, event, extreme event swale. And that performs both as a passive functioning such feature, um, but also we use that for research. Um, so as all of these um, experiments have many uh, um, an instrument in there and lots of data coming out of them. This one, again, we get to, we get to um, orchestrate and choreograph our own, our own experiment scenarios. So what you're seeing in that video in the bottom right um, is a natural event. So rain is coming down, you can see it building up behind those buns, um, entering a reservoir uh, that we have at the top right, well, the right-hand side, the top of the swale. Um, and then a series of um, sluice gates where we open that up and allow that pulse of water to pass down the swale through leaky barriers. So different features um, put in there to, to slow the flow. Um, and that's a, a technique um, adopted or borrowed from natural flood management in upper catchment scenarios. We're looking to see if we can adopt that um, in more of an urban uh, setting. So these require minimal um, uptake and otherwise look like natural features. They can be made from you know, logs, um, stones and all sorts. Um, so they're an attractive feature, but passively help slow that flow. Uh, next slide, please. So an example of one of the projects um, is Plexus. So this was um, one of the pump priming projects so together with a few of the other Ucreek facilities um, to get some activity going. And what we looked at was energy harvesting. So we know that um, energy accounts for a, a huge component of our carbon emissions. Um, so heating and cooling, Funnily enough, in fact, cooling, um, taking up a larger component of, uh, of the carbon emissions than heating, uh, which kind of feels counterintuitive, but um, as you know from last summer, um, it's a great need that um, is a facility rarely built um, in today's um, housing stock. Um, so we need to come off gas, new builds in 2025. Um, and the way we're looking to do that, or the government particularly is, is looking towards um, low grade uh, ground sourced heat pump. Um, technologies. Um, so this is low grade heat and this is purely from insulation, so shallow near surface ground source heat rather than deep boreholes. Um, and we look to green infrastructure for, the, for that. So built up environments, green infrastructure needs going in for, well, for many reasons, partly um, excess um, surface water management. Well, if it's, uh, if it's already going in, can we make double the use for it, from it? And it just so happens that, you know, we need a, a high thermal conductivity um, for that heat exchange, and that's enhanced by having um, a high soil water content. And so suds are, you know, almost a no-brainer. They're a, um, they're an ideal location for that heat exchange. Next slide, please. Um, so we looked at um, developing an experiment that would simulate um, one, one of these suds, whereby we're actually directing water to infiltrate into the ground, and what effect that would have on the transmission of heat. Uh, next slide, please. So in the bottom right is the video of our experiment going in. This is one of our lysimeters, one of our earliest um, experiments set up. And there you can see a heating coil. So that allows us to pump a pulse of heat in, so heat rejection, in other words, cooling of a neighboring building. Um, and then that's a heavily instrumented soil column. So we're then able to map um, movement of that heat pulse uh, as it passes through the soil. So that's what the diagram in the top right is. Those two yellow um, plumes are pulses of heat. Um, passing up to the top, and the top is heavily vegetated. Um, so we're looking to see what the interaction is between dumping heat into these suds, um, and is there any detrimental effect 
um, or ideally beneficial effect. Unfortunately, it was beneficial and it helps dry out your soil, increasing capacity, not too much, but it increases the storage capacity um, to a, mean that whenever the next storm event comes along, you've, you've then sort of reset and recharged without relying on just transpiration to, to draw out the water. Uh, next slide, please. And this project, Cactus, is looking at, uh, at that barrier, that capillary barrier technique I mentioned before. Um, so this is whereby we're looking at, at allowing maximum infiltration um, while also protecting buried infrastructure, whether it be pipes or sensitive clay soils for, that are prone to shrink and swell. Um, and also what we can do to ameliorate those soils. So again, wonderful choreography of uh, choreography of, of speakers, but um, yeah, we're looking at, at amending urban soils uh, for that benefit. And particularly in this case, looking at um, water treatment residual. Um, so this is the, the flocculent and iron rich um, sludge that basically comes out of um, a treatment of, of reservoir water. And that's a, a waste product uh, from the water industry. But here we're looking to use it to increase uh, water retention. So we can hold water in, in that top layer uh, and because of the relationship between the two materials, it only allows water to pass into the gravel underneath um, under extreme situations. So whenever the, the top layer becomes particularly saturated. So in so we're doing, we're able to control the amount of water that makes it to the, to the subgrade. So it's, it's almost an engineered control of groundwater recharge. Uh, next slide, please. And so for that, that's another lysimeter experiment. So this is one of the larger ones. Um, as a rather obtrusive looking uh, fence around it because again, in collaboration with the, the geological survey, we have our electrical resistivity tomography array in there. Um, so as the name suggests, it's got electrical in there and, and here we are with a rain simulator all over it. Um, the two are usually kept away from each other in, uh, in safety regards, um, but here we're using it to, to map it on quite large scale, sort of uh, two meters by four and a half meter um, uh, block of soil, we're able to map volumetrically the movement of water in response to, to artificial events that we can apply. So we can choose design storms and apply an artificial hydrograph, um, and, or we leave it uh, open to the, to the elements. Um, and that is the benefit of, of what we do is being an outdoor lab. Um, this section is now planted up, um, which is at this scale is difficult to do indoors. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, meteorology, so it's key to what we do again, more, more data than almost we know what to do with. Um, so we've really got to, got to have a good handle on, on the meteorology side of things. So as you can see in that top left photo, we're in the lee of this, this large building. Um, so we understand the, the, the issues with measurements of uh, particularly rainfall uh, in, and wind canyon effects. Um, so we have a series, a network of, of rain gauges across the site um, at either end of the street. Both sides of the street, we have um, lysimeter mounted gauges so we know what's going into the particular experiments. We also have them a uh, sort of net uh, a net office sort of spec um, pit gauge on the other side of the street uh, that's less affected by by the urban um, sort of towering of buildings around them. Um, but other properties are all, all measured as well, net radiation, temperature, humidity and the like. Uh, and on the roof, um, similarly, um, we have that again, but obviously with the downside of it being on the roof, it's not necessarily representative of what makes it to the ground. Um, However, from the roof, we have our thermal camera. Um, so that moves on a gimbal up and down the street. Here's a, a snapshot showing um, sort of the benefits of it. Where there's light blue, you can tell that there's standing water. And that's obviously quite a, a key um, indicator of where infiltration is either not occurring, whether it be on a hard surface, or at least water standing and, and slowly, um, slowly infiltrating. We can get a rate of infiltration there. Um, so we have various bits of kit around the place um, that are helping us um, in the background. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so I mentioned all this data. Um, this was the last count in 2021. I suspect there's Ross, a lot more than this. Ross, yeah. can I, um, we've got one minute left. So I'm just going to yeah. to bring things Ab to a close. Absolutely. Yeah, this is probably the, the last key slide anyway. Um, so this is where people can access our data um, and get in touch with us. Um, so we have an, an app that puts all this data online. Um, although I would encourage anyone to get in touch with me. Um, if you go on to the next slide, please, and then the next slide. Thank you. Um, yeah, contact details um, to find out more about the various projects and how to access some of the data. Um, very keen to work with people making use of the data. And there are lots of novel ways of using all this to, that we haven't necessarily even thought of. Um, so I'd be very keen to hear from people. Thanks very much. That's brilliant, thank you. Um, again, a very, uh, very interesting talk. So 
if you can so the, the slides will be available afterwards on the youtube video so people can go back and get contact details for both dan and ross um if i can ask you to stop sharing ross well, that was actually charlotte wasn't it um so i will hand over to thomas now to chair the q a session so we'll have q a for about 10 minutes and and then we'll wrap up so aim at finish Half past one. Thank you. Thank you, Lawrence, and thank you to both speakers for, for really interesting and excellent presentations, both kept to time despite technical hiccups. So, so well done, everybody. Um, we've had some question in the QA, but there's certainly uh, scope for more. Um, I think just to, to kick things off while you are contemplating putting your questions into the q a i'll start by asking ross um so some interesting examples of what look like fairly major collaborative projects that have been undertaken at the at your facilities how would somebody go about if if they had an idea would, would the would you be open to collaborate and, and what should people do absolutely um i think it's fair to say Apart from the PhD projects, none of them are just, you know, Newcastle or Engif um, sole projects. They're all consortia based. Um, and we we regularly approached by um, academic collaborators, but also industry, and whether they have a, a particular question around um, the management of their assets or or even a technological, you know, development of a, of a tool. Um, and there are different ways we can go about that. Um, but the, the first step is probably get in touch and we can sort of get, have a first initial chat about um, what we can offer um, and also what's what the various mechanisms are to make it happen um, but yes we're, we're just like a lot of the UK facilities where they're open to be used it's not uh, when you know, we're not we're not just keeping it for ourselves at all okay yeah, all right yeah yeah excellent thank you very much um Lawrence I believe you had a question yeah I had a, a question for Dan so very interesting looking at the sort of artificial soils. Have you also done some comparisons of, for example, you know, change in function with, I guess it's difficult to call them natural soils, but you know, what's what's left after some kind of development in an urban setting? You've got the underlying soil, it's disturbed and it's just kind of left. You know, plants might be planted straight into it or, or something. So I'm just wondering if you've done some sort of comparisons of what happens in urban soils post disturbance and how that you know how that function compares with some of these artificially created soils. Yeah, absolutely. And, and part of the work we did last year was to look at, in many ways, a chrono sequence, uh, a sequence of of um, soils of of different ages, um, uh, all manufactured, but. Um, but in different situations, um, soils which date back to um, just after the London Olympics um, and uh, soils which were placed only last year and soils which uh, in that matrix, soils which have been, let's say, maintained um, with amendments um, with, with, you know, people who have, have, have been part of that maintenance over that time. Um, um, irrigation, um, uh, adding uh, organic uh, composts and, and, and uh, amendments to the to the surface of those soils versus those which haven't received any amendments in, the, in that time. And so by doing this um, uh, study, we were able to look at how these soils respond over time um, to events. And of course, last year when we had that drought, there was no better time to see how these soils responded to uh, uh, to the um, uh, to that particular event, um, and you know many of the soils which were in uh, the study site, which I highlighted in the presentation, were around eighty eight percent sand. Um, and so, uh, effectively, it happened is that every day, um, although there was a hose pipe ban um, for commercial um, purposes, that hose pipe ban doesn't uh, currently. Um, apply and so uh, large large volumes of uh, water were being placed onto these soils on a daily basis the problem being is that water was basically just running through these very freely draining soils um, and out the other end um, doing very little for the plants trees and shrubs and things 
which were in there. So um, we're beginning to get a picture of, of um, you know, how soils may respond and, and what's so important in that first three or four years after placement, um, because it's not just about, um, as I said, produ producing a, a good soil in the first place, but it's about monitoring those soils and changing management plans to respond to events as they arise. Okay, we've got uh, some more questions coming in on the Q&A. So the first question is from uh, Teresa Mercer. It's for, for you, Dan. So Teresa says, says she really enjoyed your talk and she's curious about uh, what exactly you tested for in the manufactured soils that you were discussing. Yeah, so this was a, as I said before, a master's project. And so um, it was time constrained. We, we basically focused on very core physical, chemical, biological properties of the soil. So we did a full texture uh, characterization of the topsoil and the subsoil, um, but also looking at uh, pH, organic matter and carbon content, of course, from that. Um, but a large uh, part of the analysis was also down on contaminants um, and uh, looking at the increase or decrease of particular heavy metals in particular in these systems. Uh, and we did find an increase in, in some of these, which we wouldn't necessarily be too surprised about because these uh, are often contaminants of a, an urban origin or, or uh, in part from uh, aspects of an, of an urban terrain. So um, we're not too surprised about that. But obviously these are all things which are never monitored or very rarely monitored after these soils are placed. So we're beginning to put together a methodology. What we want to do now is, uh, and what we're starting to do with some new um, sites uh, in and around uh, London, is install some sensors upon placement. So rather than going in a year late and uh, basically starting from that point, is installing some sensors into the uh, manufactured soils as they're placed into these containers or beds um, and doing very much the monitoring uh, in situ uh, from day one. So that's, that's where we're going in the future. Thank you. Uh, we just have a follow-up question. Um, so when you talk about them as manufactured soil, is there any consideration of the sort of carbon budget of these things? Because I guess they should be treated like almost like building materials if they get brought into the urban environment, to built up the urban environment. So they're essentially a building material and there'll be a sort of a carbon budget associated with that. So is this compatible with a sort of net zero strategy? to manufacture soils and use soils in this way? I think there is a, a, a really great space now um, and certainly a, a multidisciplinary space um, because we're working across fields and to have that, to have that conversation, treat these manufactured soils, not just natural capital, but as essential materials in an infrastructure, in an urban infrastructure. And so I think there is uh, to some extent um, potential to um, to treat these materials with um, uh, the same kinds of terms that we would normally with with other building materials. I think that the the, the the one opportunity here is that these soils are living systems and have the potential not just to um, to, to bury carbon and, and store carbon for a long time, but also to continuously sequester carbon from the atmosphere. And that is something which perhaps is less um, uh, readily uh, available in, um, in other types of building materials. So um, I'm very much uh, interested in hearing from those part of perhaps the Reclaim network or the wider network behind this um, series, from those who are interested in, 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 in thinking about soils in, in new and exciting ways, because in the urban space, I think there is a, a great potential to um, enhance their own sustainability and resilience. And as I said, if you enhance the sustainability and resilience, the health of these soils, ultimately that will um, increase the potential for them to deliver those really key ecosystem goods and services. So uh, it's a cycle. Thank you. Maybe just time for one final question. Uh, it's a, a question for Ross from um, Christos Helios. Uh, it says, um, the question is, uh, Ross, what are you trying to study in the Green Corridor experiment? 
and is there any data available to share? Yes, yeah, so that particular experiment is in one of our larger lysimeters. Um, it's looking at um, particularly desiccation cracking. So not the most green of, uh, of experiments, actually, um, but it's part of uh, a much larger program, um, the Achilles program, which is looking at um, climate impacts on long linear assets. So this is uh, cuttings, embankments uh, for transport, but also flood defense. Um, and part of that's ultimately going to be looking at um, the impact of vegetation is an element of that. So it's, it's looking at um, both root, re, root reinforcement, um, but also um, in the grander scheme, not that particular experiment, but, but the project, um, and also the, the sort of cycles of wetting and drying, what that does to the soil fabric, um, particularly from a strength perspective, because the ultimate goal is there looking at, uh, at slope stability. Um, so there are many schools of thought, and that school of thought seems to change uh, with, as the generations go by. Um, so network rail are busy now chopping down all the trees and, and starting to regret it. Uh, um, never mind the, the biodiversity side of things, but from a sort of structural perspective of their, their asset. Um, so that, that project's coming to an end uh, at the end of this year, in fact, that program, the Achilles program. Um, so at the moment, everyone's busy sort of processing that data and, and writing it up. Um, so it's, it's probably easier to convey once it's sort of been interpreted and, and published. Um, but if there was a particular a need or interest, uh, Christos, if you want to get in touch, uh, if there's something you're working on where you'd like to link up, um, I'd be more than happy to, to talk about that further. There you go, Christos, an invitation to, to, to explore this further. I think that's probably the end of the, I, I know there are more questions, but I think we're running out of time. So thank you everybody for, for contributing. Yeah, thank you all. Um, Mark? Yeah, just bringing up the, the last few slides. So uh, just a, a plug for the next webinar. So in a month's time, the 5th of April, uh, Sebastian Fouch is from Western Sydney, Australia, uh, Western Sydney University is going to be talking on SIMPACT, which is Australia's largest smart blue-green urban infrastructure project, which sounds exciting. And uh, Stefan Lehman from the director of the Urban Futures Lab is going to be talking about what matters now, regenerative design in urban settings. So a, a, a quick plug and a, a welcome to join us in a month's time. If you haven't joined the network yet and you're interested, it's free to join. There's uh, various contact details here and you can just search for Reclaim Network Org online to find out the details about the network, what we're doing, and how to join. The, the webinars are, you know, they give us a day or so to process it, but the webinars are then put on the YouTube channel, so you can link to, through our website, you can link to previous webinars, and this one will be available to, to watch back if you missed anything and to get contact details for both Dan and Ross. So I will close by thanking everyone for joining us and thanking particularly our two uh, speakers today, Dan Evans and Ross Sterling. So thank you all and uh, see you in a month's time. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks.